Together we want to welcome another sort of alum uh, back to Holy Cross. I know a few of you know him. Father Dan Carew of the Society of Jesus is going to talk about ref the refugee crisis in the Middle East and the work of the Jesuit Refugee Service in that region. Uh, the older ones among us, a few others, may remember that Dan was a chaplain here at Holy Cross before he joined the Jesuits. Um, were you a chaplain? No, that was, after, that was after he was a student. Oh, he was a student. Was he a student? Wow. So we're still friends. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, Dan currently serves as regional director of the Jesuit Refugee Service in the Middle East and North Africa, based in Beirut, and serving Iraq, Jordan, Lebanon, and Syria. I've had the joy and the privilege, as we were recalling, of traveling with him in Lebanon, uh, in Beirut, in the Bekaa Valley, and then up in the mountains up to the north, um, and then seeing some of the shrines and holy places up there. Uh, he helped advance that Catholics and Cultures research we were doing, and I look forward to a day when we can get back to doing that again. Uh, Lebanon, as many of you will know, is a place that's really quite beautiful, has been safe and prosperous, and has really suffered through some terrible conflict at the same time, or, or in different periods too. Uh, it's still beautiful even during the conflict. So uh, Today it's really suffering again, as you may see in the news, and it's a place that's been uh, transformed by conflicts beyond its borders, or just beyond its borders. Uh, it was already home to a huge Palestinian, uh, we'd call them refugees, except they've been there for generations. Uh, but, um, and then the Syrian civil war certainly brought uh, other refugees its way, and that's really transformed the country in many ways. But the work that Dan's going to talk about stretches, is in Lebanon and stretches beyond. Over 13 million people have been forcibly displaced by the Syrian civil war since 2012. And over 4 million people need humanitarian assistance in Iraq because of the ISIS and ISIL military activity since 2014. If you take that combined, recent years, we've witnessed the largest forcibly displaced population in the world since World War II. So we're, we're living in the greatest era of refugee crisis in the world although I think most Americans pay very little attention to that. We're unaware of that. Dan first went to the Middle East to help with the initial Jesuit refugee service response to the Syria crisis from 2011 to 14. In 2019, he returned to help coordinate the response to crises in Syria and Iraq, where JRS offers a range of services, including child and adult education, accompaniment, psychosocial support, emergency assistance, and advocacy for refugee rights. In 2020, they served nearly, nearly 90,000 people. Dan has also worked with Jesuit volunteers in Micronesia and after his ordination as a Catholic priest in 2017. He served at St. Francis Xavier Parish in New York City. He holds degrees from Lemoyne College, Harvard University, University of London, and Boston College. So please join me in welcoming back Father Dan Carew. Thank you, Tom. Thank you all for being here. It's great to see many good friends, old friends, uh, and it's a real, a real gift, a real delight to be back uh, at Holy Cross, this place that is uh, very, very important uh, to me uh, in my own formation and development. <clears throat> uh, and it's a great joy to, to be able to, to speak about the work that we're doing here uh, in the Middle East, uh, the work that we're doing here on Mount St. James. Uh, I think the connection uh, has to be integral, that what we do here has to have very real implications and direct contact with the work that we as a Jesuit institution are doing in the Middle East. Uh, and that's part of the, one of the reasons that when Tim suggested that I, I uh, come back to Worcester, uh, I rejoiced at the idea uh, to be able to, in a very real way, say that the work that I'm doing now and that I love so much uh, is integrally connected to the work that got me into this gig in the first place. Uh, so I'm really delighted to be here. Um, and I, uh, we begin here today uh, with, um, we're gonna, what we'll do, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about this common Jesuit heritage that we have, uh, how it is that there is this direct connection between the work we do here uh, and the work we do in Syria or Iraq or Jordan or, or Lebanon. Uh, we'll also touch a little bit, uh, Tom went through some of the, the bullet points there, pretty depressing bullet points about the reality of the refugee and displaced person uh, situation in the Middle East, uh, highlighting some of that, talking a little bit about that. Uh, and then from there, moving on to some very specific, I'm gonna highlight uh, two very uh, important, I think, issues as we look at the questions around displacement and refugees in the world today 
and two major issues that we, as we're looking into the future, as we're here in the life of the mind, that we have to start processing. How do we, how do we work through this in terms of a program? How do we work through this in terms of our ethical response? How do we work through this in terms of our policy responses? <clears throat> and so we begin today, uh, we begin, uh, Tom mentioned the, 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 the recent chaos of the last two years in Lebanon, uh, this place that I've come to love and adore, uh, where I have been living now uh, off and on for about five years. Uh, in the picture we have there, uh, Fatima, uh, our lead psychologist for our mental health programs uh, in Beirut, uh, just the day after the August 4th, 2020 blast, uh, which destroyed uh, a, a huge chunk of downtown Beirut, including our offices. Uh, the beautiful thing there, and what I really want to emphasize is that sense of hope, the beautiful thing was that people's response wasn't to run away in fear. Uh, our staff, our social workers, psychologists, but just people of goodwill. The next morning, the beautiful thing about that is that in response to this terrible atrocity, uh, people didn't run for the hills. People came from the hills, came from all over the place. They brought whatever brooms or shovels they had. Our psychologists came down and were psychologists on the street. Our social workers became social workers on the street. The students just brought whatever shovel or, or broom they had and started cleaning up the glass off the streets. Uh, and it was a beautiful thing to see the entire country really sort of mobilized. Uh, this common suffering, uh, this became common purpose. Uh, and so as we, as we do this, I think that's an important part. Uh, we can focus just on the destruction, but there's also this great sense of hope uh, and great sense of, of movement forward. Uh, as a Jesuit, uh, but certainly at a Jesuit institution, I, I want us to start with a sense of prayer. All of our work uh, has to be grounded in reflection. Otherwise, we just spin off into uh, mindless uh, activity. Um, and we have, uh, in the words of Pope Francis here, Pope Francis came to visit uh, Iraq. Uh, and in the photo on the, on the right there, uh, Joe Kassar, the JRS country director of Iraq, uh, got the chance to meet him after the mass. Um, and I think it's important for us to, to begin with his words of prayer as we continue this, uh, this difficult journey through the time of pandemic. So I invite us just to take a moment to rest in the tender embrace of God and remember that we are loved. Now, while we are looking forward to a slow and arduous recovery from the pandemic, there is a danger that we will forget those who are left behind. The risk is that we may then be struck by an even worse virus, that of selfish indifference a virus spread by the thought that life is better if it is better for me and that everything will be fine <clears throat> if it is fine for me. It begins there and ends up selecting one person over another, discarding the poor and sacrificing those left behind on the altar of progress. The present pandemic, however, reminds us that there are no differences, no borders between those who suffer. We are all frail all equal, all precious. May we be profoundly shaken by what is happening all around us. The time has come to eliminate inequalities, to heal the injustice that is undermining the health of the entire human family. Amen. And so just as Pope Francis reminds us in those words, but also in his activity, uh, he doesn't go to the big flashy places. He goes, he went to Iraq. Uh, he went right into the very middle of it uh, and spoke about how it is that we can be sisters and brothers to one another. Um, how do we go into those places of difficulty and discord and how do we speak words of hope in the middle of them? <clears throat> Pedro Rupe was the founder of the Jesuit Refugee Service back in 1980 in response to the uh, refugee crisis coming out of uh, Southeast Asia, Vietnam very reminiscent of the photos that we all saw, the videos that we all saw just a few months ago of the crisis, the catastrophe of the end of the situation in Afghanistan and the, the return of the Taliban. Uh, as we saw that happening, we were reminded of those multiple crises, those multiple traumas uh, that our world struggles with. And what Arupe invited us to with the founding of Jesuit Refugee Service back in the 1980s and reminds us today is that refugees tell us the state of the world and we must communicate that message. Uh, and as I was praying with those words, what do the refugees of the world tell us about the state of the world today? <clears throat> I was reminded, this photo uh, on the right there 
is a photo on the, on the wall of our, the JRS office in Homs in Syria, uh, which was the center of Homs, I was there about a month and a half ago, is absolutely destroyed. Uh, the, the city around continues to exist and people continue to live there, but the middle of Homs is complete rubble. Uh, but this photo, which the, the phrase is in English, even there in the office, everything else is in Arabic, but this, this particular uh, phrase was in, was in English. And I think it's a beautiful example of what refugees tell us. On one level, that there are refugees in the world means that there is something profoundly wrong. There are structures of violence and sin, structures of evil, that allow for that, destruct that, that, allow for that rubble in the back, that allow for that destruction. And we participate in those structures. We have to be mindful of how we participate in those. That is real. We cannot run away from it. Refugees point to the very fact that something is profoundly wrong. As I always say, whenever we get to the anniversary of JRS, we do not celebrate the anniversary of our organization. We mourn that we have to still exist. My job is to make sure that my organization shuts down. That is our job as a collective organization, as Jesuit uh, Ignatian people around the world. How is it that we can be sure that everyone is safe, everyone is home, everyone belongs? And that is the work that we do. So we name that reality. We name the structures of violence that are behind those children. And yet, if all I was doing was focusing on that, the wrongness of the world, I couldn't get out of bed in the morning. What refugees also tell us in that beautiful balance and that beautiful dance of reality is that there is great hope. What we see in refugees, what I see day in and day out with the people that I walk with, are, are people of great hope. They wake up in the morning, they get their kids dressed, they put the books together, they get them backpacks out, they send them out to school. These kids are walking to the JRS school just around the corner from the, where this picture's taken. There's a great hope in that. Parents want their kids to do better. Uh, People want their parents to, do, uh, to have food and to, 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 to live good lives at the end of their lives. Uh, there is a great sense of hope among refugees. And I think that we have to hold in balance. Yes, we live, we have to focus on reality. Here in the life of the mind, we study what are the structures of reality. But we can never lose that sense of hope. How it is that we are invited into the creative instability of always moving forward, always moving beyond that. The numbers of reality are stark and painful. 84 million refugees today, more than ever before on the face of the earth. 55 million people internally displaced. Uh, the largest uh, culprits of this we see in Syria, uh, outside of Syria, there are six and a half million people who remain displaced 10 years after the beginning of the Syria crisis. Another six and a half million are displaced inside of Syria. Syria before the war was 22, 23 million people. More than half of the population has been displaced by this war and continues to be 10 years after it began. We also see uh, Afghanistan. Afghanistan today, uh, about two and a half million people are displaced as a result of the conflicts for the last, really, the last 10 years. One thing I want to highlight there, 86% of refugees in the world are in developing countries are in the neighboring countries, right next to the countries from which they left. 86%. In the United States, we're now talking maybe about accepting 50,000, I think was the last number I heard, 50,000 Afghan refugees into the United States. Today, in Pakistan, there are a million and a half Afghans. In Iran, there are 750,000. 50,000 is nothing. Iran and Pakistan have far less stable economies than we do have far less stable structures to welcome those people in. Uh, we'll get into the numbers in Lebanon, but in Lebanon, it, th th there are uh, almost a third of the population of Lebanon is now a Syrian refugee. Uh, vastly overwhelming uh, the numbers that we would be looking at in the United States. We live in a safe, comfortable bubble here. We have to be attentive. When we're talking about the refugee situation, we have to be aware that it is not what we think of these tiny little numbers may be entering in the politics of the United States, but it is a vast and enormous situation and a problem that as, I, as an American back here just for a short visit, uh, I've been more and more aware of the, the importance, the role that our country plays both in the creation of the structures that allowed for that, but 
but also hopefully in that sense of resolution to those issues. So as a, as a Jesuit, as a, how do I talk about the work that we do as JRS uh, with, our, uh, with our staff? We have almost 800 staff spread throughout the, the region between Lebanon, Syria, Jordan, and Iraq. Uh, the, the beautiful gift of our staff is that they are fully, fully immersed in the mission of what we do and how we do it in a very distinct way. Uh, very similar to the work uh, that we were doing in the chaplain's office that Mary Beth continues in the chaplain's office there now. It, it is not a matter of this idea of let me, the great and wise figure here from Mount St. James, go and help you poor little people in Appalachia or in Biloxi or in Kenya or let me go take care of you because you can't figure yourself out. The idea is to go and have that real immersion experience, to have that real sense that I am walking with my partner, with my neighbor, with my sister or brother here, that I have as much to learn from them, that I am as broken as they are, that I am as precious as they are, that we're invited into this ever greater dance of depth, into the evermore, the magis that we would talk about in our Ignatian tradition. And this is something that I find the vast majority of our staff are Muslim we have lots who are Yazidi, that small religious minority in the north of, of Iraq. How do we talk about what it is to be a Jesuit organization with people who don't know anything about Ignatius, don't really care much about the history there? And so as I'm talking with them, uh, and what I want to share here is just a quick little overview of how we do, what is the balance of our approach to the work and what I think makes it distinctly Jesuit, and I think draws a, a direct correlation with the work that we're doing here on Mount St. James. First, I, I use texts from the Qur'an Karim, i.e. from the Holy Qur'an. Uh, and I think I always focus at the very beginning on this beautiful, beautiful line. Uh, and we, God, are closer to humanity than the jugular vein. It is the closer than close. It is bone of bone, flesh of flesh. It is that there is no separation. God is so profoundly intimate. God, who knows everything, who is all wise, also says, you're worth being close to. Every single one of you, you're worth it. I want to be close to you. There's that beautiful intimacy. And the invitation from that is if you're worth it, so is your neighbor, whoever your neighbor is. They're worth being close to. They're worth being in a relationship with. Go out and engage them. Don't run away, don't build walls, go engage with them. Have that same profound depth of relationship as being closer than the jugular vein. So on one level, there is this invitation with our staff. Do not look at the people who come into the social center. Do not look at the students who come to the school. Do not look at the parents of the kids who come to the school as objects to be cured or numbers to be checked off a list. Look at them as your neighbor as the one in, with whom you're invited into ever deeper relationship. On one level, that depth of relationship, we see this in the, in the Christian tradition in that very essence of the, of the incarnation. God so loved the world that he wanted to be born into our messiness, right into the very middle of it, into this homeless refugee child. That's where God wanted to be born, not into what is easy and clean and, and removed, not into the heights of Mount St. James, but into the depths of our worries and concerns. So on one level, we have this sense of deep intimacy. And yet on the other, we have the beautiful phrase in Islamic spirituality, Allah Akbar, God is greater. Often mistranslated is God is greatest. If it was God is greatest, it would be Allah Kabir, God's the biggest or the greatest. That's not what it says. It says God is greater. It is a relational term. It is an invitation into instability. It is a, whatever you can think of, God is greater than that. Whatever the limits of God's mercy, they're bigger than that. Whatever the limits of God's justice, they're greater than that. Whatever the limits of God's love that we put around, God only loves these people, it's true that. God's love is bigger than that. It is always an invitation into the, in that instability. In our Jesuit world, we talk about this as the magis, the ever more, the ever deeper, the ever closer the evermore. Uh, that is the invitation always beyond. And so we balance that. How do I increase this depth of relationship 
but how are we also inviting people beyond what is safe and easy and comfortable? <clears throat> A very quick uh, overview of the work. Uh, Tom mentioned uh, some of the highlights of the work that we do as, as JRS, and I think some of the, what we look at is the needs of refugees in the particular areas that we're working. Um, we often think of refugee work as the immediate, we just need to put up tents, and we just need to throw food at them. Uh, yes, at the very beginning in a refugee crisis, that is what is needed. We need to put up tents, and the tents were put up. Uh, we needed big long lines of food and the food was distributed. Uh, now we're 10 years into the Syria crisis, we're seven years into the ISIS uh, crisis of Iraq, uh, and the things that we're looking at are longer term issues. How are we doing the very real work of educating children, creating a safe space where children can really develop and grow and be children? We have that as our center and as a Jesuit institution, I tell our teachers, I want us to be excellent in our educational institution. Because the excellence of education that you get here should be the same as your sister or brother in the Bekaa Valley, or in Damascus, or in Erbil. You do not deserve anything more than they. So the excellence of education for which we aspire here should be aspired to there. And yet we also know that we cannot just do this education in a bubble that there are circumstances around those children, around those families. And so we do an awful lot with mental health and psychosocial programming. So we have uh, teams of psychologists in all of our uh, programs, as well as social workers, uh, and they run programs uh, all around the, uh, the school for families that are involved or, or neighbors in the area. We run lots of programs for protection. How do we make sure that we are creating a safe space within families and within the structures from which the children come? And then how are we looking to integrate the communities in which we live? So in Lebanon, how do we integrate the Syrian population with the Lebanese population? They have to live next to one another. There have been long and historical difficulties between Lebanese and Syrians. How do we work to overcome that? How do we do, do the work of reconciliation? There was a, a representative from OCHA, a UN agency that came to visit our, our programs in northern Iraq, in, our, um, in Duhok. Uh, about a year ago, and, uh, and so they came and visited and they met with one of our program directors up there, and I was on my visit soon after that, <clears throat> I was talking to him, and Talal, who well, actually you'll see a video of Talal in a bit, uh, Talal was sharing a story, he said, I, I was telling Ocha about how we do this education, and then there are these sort of various layers of, uh, of protection that we have around them, and, and, the, and the guy from OCHA said, oh, that's great. I've heard a lot of you know, really good research about this, you know, that there should be this holistic approach to education. And I said to Lal, no shit. I mean, as a Jesuit institution, we talk about cura personalis. This is what we've been doing since 1548. This is exactly who we are. We don't just educate brains in a vat. We take care of the whole person. Uh, so on one level, this is good development work. On one level, this is good refugee response. On another level, this is something that we as a Jesuit institution have been doing for a long time. I did want to uh, yeah, forgive the overgeneralization, and there might be some experts in the room, but um, what I'm more and more aware of in my days here is how little uh, we know about the situation in the Middle East. Uh, and so I just wanted to run through some very quick highlights of what uh, seven or 10 years into these crises, what are the actual situations? What's actually going on here? So a very quick run through, we're going to go, I'm going uh, alphabetically uh, for lack of a, of a better order. Starting with of the four countries we're looking at here, which I think are very good uh, pictures of the refugee situation, displacement situation in the Middle East, uh, we're starting with Iraq. What happened there in, in 2014, uh, after a long series of uh, civil wars, internal wars, the U.S. invasion in 2003, all of these things destabilized the country. Uh, and there had been a long going, ongoing uh, series of civil wars, especially down in the south. And the country as a whole was completely ravaged. And there was really no sense of a nation of Iraq. And so by 2014, with the Syria crisis, <clears throat> Syria being just to the left there, uh, ISIS, uh, the so-called Islamic State of Iraq and Syria, or Iraq and the Levant, or Sham, uh, they, in Raqqa, which you can see just off to the left, <clears throat> declared themselves as a standalone state. And then with really very little, uh, little in their way, they descended through the northern part of Iraq. 
And they went right through uh, and then in, established their capital, in the, the new caliphate, in their mind, in Mosul. Uh, they sort of overran it. Very similar, and I have to say the last few months have been difficult for our ISIS survivors that we work with in, in Iraq. Because what happened, the evaporation of the Iraqi military was very similar to the evaporation of the Afghan military. It just sort of disappeared. And all of a sudden, ISIS had no opposition. And they just roamed through. They came down through. Uh, as a result of that, there are still, to this day, seven years after, there are 1.2 million people who are displaced inside of Iraq. And most of them are from those areas on the border there, Sinjar, Talafar, uh, Mosul, and then up in Duhok. And they moved over into Kurdistan. And so there were a series of camps. Now, among them, there were major, four major groups. Sunni Muslims, who hated the whole theory of ISIS. And there were lots of Sunni Muslims who hated what ISIS stood for. There were also Shia and different kinds of Shia Muslims who were openly opposed by ISIS and, uh, and were persecuted by ISIS. Down by Talaf Talafar, just in the, where those, there was a series of rivers there, was the, the, one of the largest Christian populations. Uh, they were given one day's notice before ISIS was to overwhelm their, uh, their area, uh, Karakosh being the largest of the towns in that area. And they, in the middle of the night, had to flee. And to hear the stories, in the middle of the night, in August, it's about 120 degrees. Uh, and so they had to get into whatever cars they had, and they fled over to Erbil. The worst of the situations, though, was for the Yazidis up in the north. Uh, ISIS did not give them any warning unlike with the Christian population. What happened to the Christian population was absolutely atrocious, despicable. It was without any question ethnic cleansing. But what happened to the Yazidis without any question was genocide, systematic planned genocide of the Yazidi population. And they overwhelmed the area of Sinjar, which was sort of the, the base of the Yazidi population in the north of Iraq. Without any warning, they massacred young men and they took young women as slaves. Uh, and then those who could escape into the mountains got over to the Hook and to the camps in Sharia, where we work today with them. And to hear the stories from our psychologists in particular, uh, our psychologists themselves are Yazidi. They've survived the same thing that the people who come to them to work through their problems and difficulties. They've heard the same stories. They've seen the same things. Uh, I will say, uh, as, a, as a Catholic priest, as a Jesuit, I, that is the th work for which I am most proud and grateful uh, with this religious ethnic minority that we, uh, that we accompany in the North. Uh, we do extraordinary work, and, uh, and I think that is the, probably the most beautiful place that, of all the, and I love the work that we do in all of our places, but that is the, the work that I love in a very deep way, just given that I'm so aware, and my own studies have been so focused on that international community saying, never again, never again, 1915 Armenia, never again. We get to 2014, never again, and yet it happens yet again. Quick overview of Iraq. Quick overview of, of Jordan. Uh, Jordan, uh, we have about 600,000 Syrians who remain there. Uh, we have a large, large Palestinian uh, uh, population. I won't get into the Palestinian question. I'm happy to entertain that in questions, but we're really just looking at post-2010 uh, issues here. Uh, in Jordan, there are about 600,000 Syrians. Most of them, uh, actually about, I think it's 83% of uh, Syrians in Jordan live outside of camps. I think that's one important thing for us to remember. We often think of refugees in camps. The vast majority of, of refugees on the earth do not live in camps. Camps are not good and they're not pleasant, but there is a general understood minimum standard inside a camp. Outside of the camp, urban refugees or people outside of the camp in rural spaces don't have that same minimum. So the refugees living in Amman, where there is the largest concentration of Syrians, uh, don't have a minimum. So they can just go hungry uh, without any help. I will say just one thing to highlight here, a, a ray of hope, uh, the Jordanian government has made a very good and deliberate effort uh, at trying to do a good job in response to the refugee crisis. They're making a very deliberate effort at first 
using the resources that are coming through Jordan uh, for the refugee crisis to help develop Jordan. Uh, and so it's a terrible situation, but they're trying to do something good with it. Uh, classic story, it was in Jordan that the first refugee on earth was vaccinated against COVID. Uh, they're very deliberate about that, and they really are trying to be uh, deliberate and, and forward thinking about that. One area where Jordan really needs to pay attention and one area that we work a lot is with non-Syrian refugees. So there are Yemeni, South Sudanese, uh, ref Somali refugees who are there, and they have no rights. Syrians have very few rights, but the non-Syrians have no rights. And so one thing to pay uh, close attention to. Lebanon, uh, this beautiful and broken country, uh, civil war from 1975 to 1990. A lot of that you had the Syrian army occupying. Uh, we have all sorts of stories talking to grandparents and parents of, of uh, people that I know, of students at the Jesuit University in Beirut, talking to them. And there are all sorts of terrible stories about the Syrian army torturing this one, killing my grandfather, throwing this one from wherever. And yet, when I was there in 2012, uh, I was working at the Jesuit University. I was in campus ministry there helping out. There was a six-month window. And at a particular point in the violence of Syria, at the beginning of the war, people just moved around in Syria and they didn't leave. At a particular point in the war, people realized they could not stay in Syria any longer. Lebanon is a country of four million people. In a six-month window, a million and a half Syrians entered, fleeing the war. 33% of the population. It would be as though 100 million refugees entered the United States in the next six months. So as you can imagine, there were Syrians everywhere, under every bridge, in every abandoned building. And as I was working at the Jesuit University, men and women for others were doing reflection on action. They're doing service work with the kindergarten and the old folks' home. Uh, all of a sudden, they're saying, what should we do in response to this situation with the, with the Syrians. I'm like, don't ask me, I'm a stupid American. Go talk to them, ask them, interact with them. And so we went out and the beginning was food and blankets and housing. And then later it became education, a safe place for our, the mothers and the older girls, a place for them to go during the day and feel safe and build community. And so we entered, opened a, a network of uh, schools and community centers along the coast and along uh, the Bekaa Valley. In this country today, what I will say, in the last two years, the economic crisis, the political crisis, have completely unbound uh, Lebanon. This once beautiful country is a shell of its former self. The example that I use in terms of the currency destabilization, there are two legal currencies in Lebanon, the US dollar and the Lebanese currency, Lebanese lira. We have the option of paying in either one. We continue to pay in US dollars because it's reasonably stable. A cleaner, who is the lowest paid of all of our staff, and a cleaner in one of our schools gets $275, $300 a month. That now has the buying power of more than what a general in the Lebanese army makes. So a general continues to make the same salary but in Lebanese lira, and it has been so devalued that they're earning less than $275 a month, which means they can't feed their children. And so the other day on Thursday when we had a, a skirmish between two militias on the streets of, of Beirut, not far from our office, it was the army that had to come in and clean that militia, separate Hezbollah from one of the Christian militias. They are the ones that had to separate them. If the general's not able to feed his or her own family, then what are the soldiers gonna do? Are they really gonna follow the orders? Are they really gonna say, Let's end this violence, or let's, fuck it, we're all done, let's keep going. That's what I'm most afraid of as we look at the destabilization of, of Lebanon. What will happen if there becomes no standing military to guard against the multiple militias that are already there? What happens when there is no state uh, and we descend into that real chaos? Telling point, there were all sorts of reports about two years ago about Syrians returning to Syria from Lebanon because the situation was getting bad. The economic situation, as I just outlined, is really bad in Lebanon. And yet no, Syri no actual numbers, legitimate real numbers of Syrians are returning. They're still so afraid of the situation in Syria. And I was just talking to one of our staff members in Damascus this morning. He was saying that in Syria, 
the standing line from everyone is give us the bombs, the bombs we can avoid. The fact that we can't buy bread means that that happens to everyone across the board. We're all equal in that suffering. I can't feed my family. That same economic situation that's happening in, in Lebanon is also affecting Syria. So the Syrians are not going back. So you have a million and a half refugees who have uh, even less uh, than the Lebanese, and they're remaining there. And then beautiful Syria, this beautiful, beautiful country, um, absolutely gorgeous. Again, six million people who continue to be displaced there. There is, we don't hear about it a lot, but there is still active military activity going on there. Certainly up in the north, uh, if you see Idlib, um, up in the far north, there continues to be uh, military activity up there. And until just about a month ago or so, down in the south in Dera, uh, there was continued military activity down there as well. Interesting thing about that is that what has happened recently is that the state, whenever there is a flare-up and the rebels start fighting against the state, the state, with the help of Russia, will go into that town or village and they will say, you have two options. Either we take all of the rebels and we move them somewhere else, or we're just going to destroy the town. And what they do is they've been putting all of the rebels up in Idlib. And so the state can, in its mind, say, every one of our enemies is up in this nice, safe, clean place. And then the rest of the country, everyone loves us. We're all fine. And I just think of that spiritual malfunction of all of us, of wanting to think that my enemy is over there. Nice, clean lines, separate, removed. Somehow or another, I don't have to interact with them, and I can just remove them from my reality. Uh, Syrian government is in the middle of doing the, the same thing. Just to, to highlight some of this stuff with, uh, with the Lebanon situation, uh, a couple of weeks ago I was out in the Bekaa Valley, and uh, in one of our programs up in Baalbek, up in the north of, of the Bekaa Valley, I was talking to Nada, who is our, our program director out there, who's just this frost nature, this great, uh, amazingly strong, courageous woman. And she runs a program. We have three schools up there, elementary schools and a community center uh, and a couple of outreach programs. And we got talking about things. And I said, Nada, I'm going to go see these Americans next week. Could you just give me an outline? What are the things that you're working with? What are the, the struggles you have on a, on a particular day? And so she sent me a quick email. And she said, there is no electricity. They're used to get one or two hours a day from the state. Now they're getting nothing. So how do you run a school when there's no light in the classroom? How do you run a school when uh, there's absolutely no access to Wi-Fi for the teacher? Uh, that there's no fuel. So in the schools, we used to have a generator. And that used to power at least the light bulb in the classroom. Uh, we can't afford fuel anymore. There's just no fuel around. Uh, the difficulties of security. There were shootings on the streets of Baalbek, and there were kids close by the other day. She was afraid for the life of her children. Uh, we had a child shot in an accident just last year, uh, in an accident between two different groups. Difficulties of security. Increasing costs. We give a little lunch uh, to the students every day, a little sandwich and a piece of fruit and a juice. Um, we're having a hard time paying for the bread just to make sure that that happens. And then the medicine shortages. How does a teacher who has high blood pressure, when there is no medicine, zero, not even Tylenol, how do you sort of work your normal work, and do your normal uh, activities if you can't even do that. And yet, what I want to highlight there is on the left, on the, the left there, um, the activities do continue. This is actually in our center in Borj Hamoud and uh, just outside of downtown Beirut. And this was part of the summer camp that we had there at that center. Uh, activities do continue. Kids do continue to come to the, the programs, uh, socially distanced, masked, all that uh, good COVID stuff. But activities do continue. People do uh, continue life. Uh, life does continue. What I want to highlight here in one of the situations, these sort of theoretical situations that I think we have to think through uh, in response to COVID, uh, what we see in COVID is the necessary separation of people. Uh, we have to be removed from one another. That same center where that picture was taken uh, is a few years ago, there was this beautiful story. It was a group of Iraqi Christian women who came into Lebanon, and they were fleeing ISIS. And so in their mind, as Christians, they were fleeing Islam. And they had so associated all Muslims with ISIS. And so they were just afraid of every Muslim. But the neighborhood was almost entirely Syrian Muslim. And so they lived in this little enclave. They never talked to anyone outside. They never interacted with their neighbors. 
And they came to our center and they talked to one of our social workers and they said, we really need to process this stuff with ISIS. And so they wanted to start a support group. And so they started this support group, but they refused to allow any Syrian Muslim women in there. Slowly over time, that support group, when they would finish their group, they would go out and they would get tea and coffee in the sort of common spaces around. Slowly, slowly they see, oh, there's these Syrian women and they're also in a support group. They were running away from ISIS. They had Mary, the same problems I do in the same neighborhood, difficulties with their children, difficulties with their families. And all of a sudden they started to realize just because they were close to one another, they really weren't that different. And then the beautiful story is that it was just a couple of years before, before COVID when we could gather in large groups uh, during Ramadan, when you have the iftar celebration, the end of the fast on a particular day, uh, every year we would have a big iftar uh, in that same space where that picture is taken. You can have 150, 200 people there. It's this great big outdoor space. Uh, and in that particular year, it was these Iraqi Christian women who wanted to do all of the cooking for these 200 people to come to iftar knowing that they were all Muslim, knowing that they were all Syrian. They had so grown to know their neighbor just by being close to them. And I think this is one of the things that we have to, as we're moving out of this COVID time, how do we do the very real work of like running into one another and just hanging out and lingering with one another and being close to one another? How do we do that? That is part of my push with our staff right now. How are we creating spaces where we can remain COVID safe and uh, our staff has been vaccinated, thanks be to God, but vast majority of the people on the street have not. Um, how do we still, in a safe way, create those spaces? Just a couple of quick stories uh, from Iraq uh, in the Yazidi in the very far north. These are some pictures there. Uh, when we had to close the schools because of the government uh, shutdown of, of schools, we decided to do school goes to you. And so the teachers would pick regions of the tented communities and they would go and go, uh, go student tent to student tent. Uh, and do classes in the, in the spaces there. And you see one of the teachers uh, handing off a, a maths uh, textbook uh, to one of the, the children. And then also, there was a, on the right there is a, a group. Um, this is a group, that been, these are ISIS survivors. These are women that had been in slavery, sex slavery, for up to two years. Uh, and this was a support group. And as part of that, they wanted to do something. They didn't just want to, they needed to do something active. And so they, we had this uh, sewing material. And so they started sewing masks. Uh, and so all around you saw these little kids with polka dot masks uh, walking around in, in Sharia uh, collective. On the right, uh, those are a group of, of kids at our, uh, one of our kindergartens in Sharia, Yazidi kids. Um, just a quick note on that. If you look, uh, like the little JRS logo down there at the bottom, our, our normal, when we're doing swag, it's normally in that dark blue. And so normally when we distribute backpacks or t-shirts or whatever it is, it's usually in that dark blue. Uh, in the 19th century, uh, the Ottoman Empire, or one group of the Ottoman Empire, tried another genocide on the Yazidi back in the 19th century, and it was that dark blue colored flag. Uh, and so whenever we do anything with the Yazidi, we do not use that blue, we use bright orange. And so the backpacks for these uh, Yazidi kids are in a bright orange. Um, now the question here, and this is the theoretical question that I, I think needs the life of the mind and a little bit of, of separation. If you see on the left there, that's, that's Sinjar. That's the town from which they fled. Um, and if you see um, along the road there, you'll see these cement blocks or rocks there. And they're painted red on one side and white on the other. The white side has been cleared of landmines uh, and unexploded ordnance. Uh, I took that picture about a month ago. The red, uh, the, they have not cleared that of landmines or ordnance. So that's unsafe. So we stayed on the road and we didn't venture into any of the houses or the former houses. About six months ago, we were getting all of these reports from Germany, uh, in particular a lot of our donors are based in Germany, about the Yazidis are moving back to Sinjar. And then all of a sudden we started to see some, several major international NGOs who do great work made the decision to start closing their operations in Sharia, where we have that kindergarten and others, and started moving their operations to Sinjar. And so then there was this, among the Yazidi, should we move? If they're gonna close the schools or they're gonna stop the food distribution here, should we start moving? And so I would pick up the phone and I would talk to Firas and I would say, our, our lead psychologist there, are Yazidis really moving back? And he goes, no. 
there is a small fraction of Yazidis who have mostly for, for land purposes, to claim land, have moved back. And then about 50% of those who had returned to Sinjar have determined that it is so difficult to live there, they've come back to Sharia, come back to the camps, that life was so difficult. And so what we find here um, is there is this, the, the decision has to be among the displaced people. A government cannot decide that, a, uh, that refugees need to return. That cannot be the decision. The international law says it cannot be. Non-refoulement is the term for it. A government cannot decide that refugees need to leave or that refugees should return to their home. The government of Lebanon cannot say Syria is safe enough, you must return. That is non-refoulement and international law says we cannot do that. But what happens when the international NGOs, when the humanitarian organizations are moving their operations, even when the, the refugee population itself doesn't want to move? Does that force their hand? And so as I've been telling our staff all across the board, I will happily move our operations to Sinjar if the Yazidis decide to move back. And this is where we get into that, the very foundation of who we are and I think humanitarian work needs to be. We start with a proximity to people. We start with what they want. We start with that relationship. If they make that decision as smart, capable, fascinating people, precious, if they make that decision, hell, we'll move the schools, we'll move everything. But I'm not gonna force them to move to a place where they can't walk off the roads. And so I think this is part of, as we're looking at international humanitarian law, what is the role of nations but also, what is the role of the non-nations, the, the humanitarian organizations, some of these other players at hand? And so with that, uh, if this works, we've got a quick little video here. Uh, I was hoping we had a video. Um, and this is a video of uh, one of our uh, program directors, a Yazidi himself. My name is Talal Murad, I'm Yazidi. Yazidis is a peaceful religious ethnic minority with a history of 6,000 years. I am 33 years old. I have lived through two genocide. The last one was on the hands of the ISIS. On the 3rd of August 2014, we heard that the ISIS attacking southern areas of Sinjar Mountain. We heard the things we saw the ISIS members on the way. I could remember the screaming of my mom, screaming of my sisters that they were saying they will come to kidnap us. In that day, the ISIS did many crimes against the Yazidi people. They killed around 1,290 persons. They kidnapped more than 6,400 people, most of them children and women. But thank God we could be able to fled out to Kurdistan in that day. And seven years later, me and my family, we are living here. <laughs> There is no efforts from the government to find a safe ground or dignified ways for the people to return to their areas. As a Yazidi young, I found that it is my duty to stand with my community and advocate on their rights. I am a protection and education director at JRS Sharia here in Kurdistan, Iraq. The JRS mission is to accompany, serve and advocate for the people. We are going to the old village around Sharia. Each month we have 100 
food basket and hygiene kits to provide to the hundred families here in Sharia Collective and seven villages around. It's very important to be close to those families, to accompany them, to give them hope that there is some organization, some people are caring about them and trying to provide their needs. The people that the JR is currently servicing, more than 20,000 people. The purpose of the project that we have here in Sharia to provide the education services, protection and mental health, psychosocial support for the pupil and also looking for the justice for their rights. <laughs> We provide in Kashasi Center in terms of mental health. We are providing the medication. We providing them with the legal services. We are providing the transportation for the student in education. We have a kindergarten to receiving 220 children per year. We have a youth education program for the student of the grade nine and grade 12. And also we have the adult education courses which is English and literacy and computer. Besides that we have skills training courses in terms of sewing, barbering, confectionery and hairdressing courses. Through the JRS advocacy work we selected the issues of Yazidi missing persons to have interventions and raise this issue to the international community. We also bring attention to the situation of Christian Yazidis for the Yazidis, I hope that this year will be the last year of the displacement and hopefully those people will return to their home in a safe and dignified way. They deserve peaceful, they deserve a good life, they deserve a life like others. I tried and I am still trying to be a voice of my community. I think it's very important missions that the JRS has here in Iraq and around the world to give the people hope to make them stand for their own future. I know Talal is just a great guy. <laughs> He's a big teddy bear uh, and likes to, yeah, likes to have a, a likes to sing and dance and, and do wonderful things. He's a wonderful, wonderful guy. Uh, and so I, you know, I, I think the, the question always comes up, uh, certainly with uh, university folks, uh, what do we do, where do we go, uh, and I just, be partners with Talal, uh, start local, start here, you're in Worcester, there's a beautiful, beautiful migrant refugee community here. Get to know them, go in depth, know your neighbor, do your studies, live the life of the mind, go deep here, but get to know your neighbors as well, and make sure that the stuff you learn here has real real meaning on the streets uh, with the recent refugee and immigrant population here in Worcester, this beautiful town. Uh, get to know them, go in depth there, start with that. Uh, do the very real work of building those relationships, of learning stories, of being awkward enough to hang out with your neighbor. Uh, as I tell my staff, if it's not awkward, you're not doing it right. Like keep staying there, hang out there, linger. Uh, so keep doing that. Uh, and then the other thing that I, I really, again, just having been here for a couple of weeks, we, those of us with the golden passport, a U.S. citizenship, uh, you have the right to, to raise your voice to the government and say, when we're really screwing it up, we gotta change something. We gotta look at it in a different way. Uh, we, as members of an academic community, have a voice that hits way above its weight. Uh, how do we do that in the work that we do, the research that we do, the the, the activities that we run here, the, the, the talks and the sessions that we're running here, the workshops that we offer, how are we doing the very real work of learning the issues of the world that we don't understand? Um, I, uh, you know, I, I have loved being able to talk a little bit about the Middle East, but the questions that I get sometimes just demonstrate, yeah, we, we don't really know what's going on. And it's complicated, no question. Uh, it, uh, without any doubt at all, and it, but ask the questions, go in depth, learn the stuff. Uh, have a good sense of that. Uh, have that be an integral part of your education here, your life here of uh, Mount St. James. So with that, I thank you. Delighted to be back, and I'm happy to entertain questions as helpful. Uh, 
excellent, excellent questions. Uh, it's true in Lebanon, but it's true across the, 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 all of the countries. We very deliberately, we hire the best candidates who are interested in the mission that we, that we live out. Uh, for instance, uh, Heba Elbasha is our country director in, um, in, in Lebanon, a Druze woman, uh, Lebanese Druze. Uh, her family uh, politically was very suspicious of having Syrians come into Lebanon. Uh, we have staff who are Christian, who are from the Shouf, uh, who after a couple beers, they're like, I never met a Druze before, and now she's my boss. And you know what, she's, she's a good boss. And, uh, and she really loves the refugees and she loves the work we're doing and, and she understands what we're doing. And I thought, because I was Maronite, I was the only one who could understand a, a Christian organization. But this Druze Lebanese woman gets it. Um, and so, as I say, 95% of our staff are Muslim in the region. Uh, in places like uh, Sharia, 100% uh, of our staff, yeah, 100% of our, oh no, we have two Shia Muslims in all of the, of the program that we have in Sharia. Uh, everyone else, 100 people are, are Yazidi themselves. Uh, I think it's integral that we're hiring from the local communities. So it's a Yazidi, social, it's a Yazidi uh, psychologist or social worker who's doing the work of repairing community, repairing uh, people's lives and helping them work through their, their issues. Uh, so that's essential. Um, so that is, that's the hiring question. Uh, and that's an area, I will say, that I think is a prophetic place for us. If you look at other, uh, in particular Christian, well, faith-based across the board, um, most of them, the reasonable ones, will be open to anyone who walks in the door. There are the crazies in, in every one of the sects who only help their people. And that's just complete crap and a complete obfuscation of, of reality, of the truth. Uh, but most of them, other faith-based organizations, will anyone who walks in, vulnerable. I'm very deliberate, and, and we, I, as far as I know among the Christian organizations, are the only ones who are very deliberate about hiring whoever walks in the door and who is committed to the mission, able to buy in, able to do the job. Uh, and, uh, and so that's something that I, I hold as, a, as an area of pride. And I think it's, it's a prophetic witness, it really is, you know, that, that what we talk about, you know, that stuff that I talked about, the sort of the Quranic uh, or Islamic uh, you know, phrases at the beginning, those, um, those are not something that are limited just to Islam, they're not something, you know, the, the foundation of what I see our work being is something that people of goodwill can, uh, can join and really, you know, I, I, have, I have grown profoundly uh, as, a, as a Catholic priest by my interaction with Yazidis, by my interaction with, uh, with Sunni and Shia uh, Muslims. And so that, um, I, I really do see that as an integral part of it. And I think this is, as we talk about the real work of advocacy, the real work of reconciliation, we've got to live it out. I mean, we've got to be an example of that. And I think, uh, well, the, the, the story that, I, that I'll often use is, um, and, and how are we seen as a, as a religious organization, um, and, and in doing that, uh, when we look at, so this is outside of the faith-based NGOs, you know, you're looking at Save the Children and UN agencies and things like that. There's sometimes a hesitancy around the religious thing, similar to relations between Holy Cross and Williams or whatever. And they're like, oh, you know, these crazy, you know, Catholic people or crazy Muslim people or crazy whoever. Uh, what, I, what I'll put, push back on them and I'll say, uh, y'all arrived here 10 years ago in response, in Lebanon in particular, all arrived here 10 years ago in response to the Syria crisis. We're a Jesuit work. The first Jesuits arrived in what is now Syria and Lebanon in 1656. When I'm thinking about our work, it is as a Jesuit work. Now, hopefully JRS, as I say, can close in a particular window of time. But I'm thinking about the next 350 years as a Jesuit and as a Jesuit institution. How are we feeding into the Jesuit schools that are there and have been there for a long time? How are we feeding into the Jesuit university, the Jesuit hospital? How are we feeding into those things that have been part of that uh, environment for a long time? So how do we think of our work in a 350 year window uh, rather than just in the, in the 10 year window of the, and so not to say that we're any better by any means, but I think there's a, there is the value of that. Uh, that depth and that, and that longevity. We have a relationship here, and for those 350 years, we've been working with integral human development, you know, across the board, and good days and bad days, and we can point to negative examples, certainly. 
Um, as much internal Christian, <laughs> like the Jesuits and the Maronites have had a, a rocky relationship, and they're all Catholic. <laughs> so we can point to the bad examples, but we can also point to the great examples uh, over that 350-year window of we're, we're making this work. Our brokenness, your brokenness, our giftedness, your giftedness, and we're, we're figuring it all out. So I see that as a, as a real benefit. A great question. Thank you. Something I found really powerful was you and the JRS's uh, uh, motivation to be for people of Izzy and like work in proximity or like not wanting to move unless they wanted to move or unless you felt or they felt it was safe. Mm -hmm. um, I thought that was really powerful. I find it really commendable. Um, I, this is kind of a broad question. I don't know if it's outside of your scope, but for what would what would the flip side of the argument be for an NGO humanitarian organization to yeah. go ahead and move yep. without the consent of the refugees that they're working for? Right. Great question. It, it, it is, and I get it. And so I, I want to you know, give credit where credit's due. It is always better for people to be home. When they're displaced, uh, it's not good for them. Uh, there is an uncertainty about that for them and the host community. Now, it happens that Sharia, where they're displaced at the moment, had a history of being predominantly Yazidi, so there's not a huge ethnic or religious tension Sharia does not have a lot of resources. And so the limited resources that had worked for the X number of people that had been there before now have to be stretched that much further. The jobs that were there have to be you know, spread among far, far more people. And so it's, it's always better for people to be home. And we, again, that's our goal here, to make sure that people are at a place that is safe and home-like. Uh, and so the desire is, um, the argument is that it is safe enough in Sinjar uh, for people to return. Um, I, I, don't th I don't think they made that decision after having vet visited Sinjar. You know, like, I'm not, like, they're writing these, what I, what I always found frightening or funny about it was that they were writing these reports from, uh, from Aachen or from Berlin or, or, or Paris. Like, it's fine to say, in theory, Refugees need to return home. But these are the same organizations that were writing about Syrians returning to Syria, and it was a couple of thousand in light of a million and a half. So you, we can point to some data that shows some movement, Syrians from Lebanon into Syria, Yazidis from Sharia to, to Sinjar. We can point to some data. And if you're taking that, those numbers, that data, and you're looking at it, and you want to put a rosy spin on it, now, there's the, the positive, we want people to be home. There's the cynical, which is um, for us to show one of the things, the weird things and what I really struggle with in our, it's becoming an industry uh, of, of humanitarian work. It, it helps to show success and our donors wanna see movement and progress and something new. And if we keep saying year in and year out, we educated this number of kids, and we fed this number of people, and we housed this number of people, but the goal is to get them home, and none of them have moved. In the donor mind, in a sort of a free market capitalist mentality that we're thinking that has started to define a lot of humanitarian work, there's no success there. There's no easy, demonstrated sort of movement towards success, you know, like the zero refugee point. Uh, and so the cynical part of the response that I would have is that we're looking to push the data in a particular direction to show that what we're doing succeeds, therefore you should continue to fund us. Um, we, we have a major grant that you saw in the video, um, I, I'm really frightened by it, but even in Iraq, our stickers, uh, we have a big U.S. flag on them. We don't do that in government of Iraq held territory, but in Kurdistan, the U.S. government's fine. But that is funded by PRM, a USAID program. Uh, we get $4 million a year from them. And, and they, um, what we do when we reapply for PRM every couple of years is we have to show real progress and that we're now responding to new needs or changing development needs. And on one level, the situation in, in Sharia has remained the same for seven years. People are displaced, kids need to go to school, ISIS survivors need some sort of help to work through the issues of having been a slave for two years. Um, that, that kind of trauma doesn't go away 
in two years of therapy, as intensive as it is. It might be diminished, it might be changed, but there's not real progress there. And so this, there is a desire, cynically, to, to show real progress, and that would be real progress if we could get them to go back. So, yeah, a couple of quick answers. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Very my, my pleasure. I'm happy to stick around if you have a question. We can chat, or yeah, we can chat individually. Great. Thank you all very much. <laughs>